Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. This is our second iteration of our Living Legends webinar. This is an educational series that was inspired by finding ways to support our college coaches across the nation and also bridge the divide between wrestling and other sports. Today, I am thrilled to share that we have um, a transformational leader, a transformational coach in the form of Leroy Smith. He's the executive director of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame. <clears throat> we want to give you an update with what's been going on with the women's wrestling landscape at the college level. We're thrilled to share that yesterday, the NIIA had its first women's collegiate national championship. This was a historic moment because for many years in the making, this was a dream that has finally been realized providing opportunities for women across the NAI landscape to compete for a women's collegiate national title. Within the NCAA landscape, we're thrilled to share that the first phase of achieving NCAA emerging sports status has come to fruition. The second phase of reaching the minimum criteria of 40 schools to be able to apply for NCAA championship status has also been achieved. This last weekend at the women's NCAA championships, there was a minimum threshold of 40 programs that were needed to um, support the bid. And we're thrilled to share that 43 programs are now under um, the umbrella and meet that criteria. Women's wrestling will be moving forward onward towards championship status. The California Community College Athletic Association has granted emerging sports status to the California Area Community College. This provides opportunities for girls along the West Coast that are in that collegiate system to be able to now wrestle under the umbrella and compete for their respective home programs. Congratulations. Leroy, as we talk about you, your family is legendary and you've been underneath, um, it, it's, you've had con incredible impact across our nation, both within wrestling and also as a business leader and um, movement leader within wrestling. You've had that storied career. What did you learn about the about wrestling as an athlete and a coach that brought you and your business career to the next level? Well, I think that, that you know, obviously you have to work hard to be a successful wrestler. And uh, so the work ethic, uh, growing and developing a strong work ethic is, is kind of the foundation for success in, in any walk of life. Uh, and then to work smart and uh, be strategical uh, is important as well. And those, those two really carry over well into other walks of life and other pursuits that one may have, but it certainly uh, helped me uh, to advance in the sport and, as a wrestler and as a coach would be to work hard and to work smart. And, and working smart means, you know, no acquiring resources, uh, leveraging your resources, and in, in, as a wrestler, that means skills, that means conditioning, that means, um, uh, you know, getting yourself psychologically uh, fit uh, to perform. And so, uh, and then you take that to other uh, walks of life, coaching, uh, you're trying to do that with your athletes, and then outside of coaching and business and other walks of life, uh, uh, teaching, uh, you, you really want to structure things uh, very similar to that, uh, those, those traits that help you um, uh, become better at what your, your goals are. And Leroy, is there any advice or coaching that you are hesitant to accept as an athlete, but as a CEO, you're now able to see the value in it? Uh, would you ask that question again? <laughs> yeah, like as, a, as an athlete or as a coach, was there any advice that you were hesitant to receive um, that you now see the value in it? Maybe not in that moment, but as you've evolved. Yeah, I think uh, a couple of things there. One is, uh, you know, you, you, 
you want to always be a good learner and uh, to uh, a lifelong learner at that. And sometimes you have to uh, borrow good ideas from others. And, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's called it to some degree, it's called research. And uh, uh, you're always looking to better yourself and find ways and find people. And that's what I mean by resources that can help you do that. And uh, I, I, I think that those, uh, those actions and uh, uh, ability to process um, that type of a, a, a personality and uh, way of life uh, will, will be a tremendous benefit to, to uh, a coach, to uh, anyone outside the sport. Uh, I think we take that from wrestling. And uh, because to be a good wrestler, you can't just stay the same. You have to evolve. You have to change. You have to adapt. And uh, you're, you're trying to find, uh, you know, those resources, those coaches, those workout partners that can make you better. Well, when you get into to business or you get into fundraising, you're trying to do the same thing. How can I find people to help this goal, this mission, uh, be fulfilled? And um, uh, so it, it, it's that kind of perspective that, that uh, really uh, excited me about, you know, transitioning from uh, wrestling, coaching rather, to uh, working uh, in other walks of life, but in particularly with the Hall of Fame now uh, and in, in this uh, mission-driven organization that I'm in now. And Leroy, you're, you're from a legendary wrestling family. What is one of the most important things that you learned from your wrestling family that you now use as a leader at the National Wrestling Hall of Fame? Well, there's, there's my family and then there's the wrestling family, but it, it's very similar in that, uh, um, you know, my mom would always say, you know, if, you know, a family that stays together, prays together, uh, is together. And, and you have to work it at, at being a family and uh, creating a family, developing a family, sustaining a family and uh, passing on a family uh, uh, traits that, that uh, keep it strong, make it strong. And, uh, you know, we do that in our family. Uh, and, and then when you look at the wrestling family, it's very similar. It's, it's a very intimate sport. You know, wrestling, you can't do it alone. And you have to have people and you're in very close proximity. And uh, there's no more intimate sport than wrestling. And you have to, uh, well, you, you gain that sense of, uh, of family, of closeness, if you will. And it's your ability to nurture that, your ability to appreciate that, your ability to care for others that becomes so important. And I think it's very much why uh, wrestling is, been, is the oldest sport. Yeah. I think society, society under, maybe doesn't understand that enough. And uh, that's part of our job to educate them about, you know, why is wrestling important? And uh, it's important for a lot of reasons and certainly contributing to family in, in a community uh, in a culture, uh, as well as, uh, um, you know, one's own family. Yeah. Thank you. At the National Wrestling Hall of Fame, you're the executive director and part of the, tell us how you got into that role and the evolution of it. And, and really then we'll start diving into fundraising. Yeah, sure. Well, um, when I was coaching in Arizona State, I was, uh, I had, uh, uh, 
had a good career there and and I wanted to see you know I'd always taught the, the student athletes to prepare for life you, you know you're not always going to be able to wrestle and it, you may not and and most of them may not work in the sport although you try to uh give them that passion that they'll uh some will coach and and uh certainly staying connected in some way but many won't uh, most won't they they go into other walks of life and uh i said well, you know well it's time for me maybe to to see if i can sample that and try it and do it and what do i want to do and uh i felt that uh uh, you know, maybe I want to be an athletic director. I like managing things. I like uh, that perspective, see the big picture and, and uh, try to help build, uh, build that for others. And, and uh, uh, I can see, you know, uh, we're not the only sport in the world. And uh, so I thought, well, maybe I'll be an athletic director. But then I thought a little deeper about, well, yeah, you just can't go from being a high level coach in wrestling to a uh an, an athletic director you have to start somewhere so i i thought well what aspect of athletics administration uh would be fitting and i th i thought about fundraising it came to me because you know i'd i'd had success in in and worked at uh that aspect of it you're dealing with successful people for the most part in fundraising, I really like that, and uh, um, it, and so I bridged out into that world. Went to a uh, uh, a Catholic private academy, uh, uh, prep school, and uh, an Abbey and academy, uh, and uh, uh, spent a few years there with the capital campaign. Then went to the University of Florida and got into a billion dollar campaign because, you know, if you're going to be associated with something, uh, uh, if you're going to build, rebuild your career, you want to do it in, in the most significant way possible in a short period of time to get to where you want to go to. And I thought, well, everybody in athletic administration needs to, uh, athletic directors need to be able to raise money. And, uh, and that's true in a lot of <laughs> sectors of, of sport too, as well. But uh, that's the kind of course I was going on. And then while I was at the University of Florida, I got a call from the chairman of the board of the Wrestling Hall of Fame, Jim Keen Sr., who was looking for another executive director. And it happened to be where I went to college uh, would be a return to back to Stillwater, Oklahoma. And my family at the time, we had moved around, made a couple of moves. Uh, of course, I'd made a few moves in my coaching career and uh, as well. So they felt maybe that'd be a good, stable place to be for a while. And I've been here since 2004. So it, it did turn out that way for me. That's awesome. And I'm glad that it has brought you home. Within the fundraising space, you know, fundraising can be scary and intimidating, especially in wrestling. Why is that? And how have you been able to navigate any of the, that nerves or apprehension within the sports space? Well, uh, that's a that's a good question. And what uh, what happens is, you know, there, there, there's some of these you hear about these. What are the big fears in life? You know, the radar uh, for the top top, let's say two or three. Well, one of them is public speaking, right? Uh, that can be one of the most scariest things for people to do that. It, it, and uh, the other uh, can be fundraising. Uh, it ranks up there high too. And why is that? Well, you know, it's intimidating for people to want to ask others for financial help. And uh, uh, it's, it, you know, there's a lot of successful people, as you well know, Sally, that can contribute an enormous amount in their lives, very philanthropic, but just don't ask me to ask someone else. Uh, they, they don't like that either. Many, many of our board members, many of our uh, philanthropic supporters in the sport and in your schools, your colleges, 
you know, they will give, but they don't want to ask for you. Uh, that's something that uh, they're not comfortable with. And there's a process for that. And it's, it, it, and, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in, uh, but, but that's really, uh, you know, in some, sometimes you're going to get as many no's, not sometimes, you're going to get as many no's as you are yeses. And that denial, uh, some have a really tough time getting over uh, when, they, when, they're, uh, when they're told that uh, from a donor that, uh, they're not going to be able to help or for whatever reason, they're not able to help uh, at this time. And you had really thought, oh, this is the perfect donor. But, you know, you just move through it just like you do in wrestling. You just power through. You just keep putting one foot in front of the other. You keep working hard. You keep trying. You keep working smart and smarter. And, um uh, you'll get, you'll get that, uh, next donor and, um, uh, they'll come your way, but that's, uh, that's, that's what, that's how I did answer that question. What, what is fundraising today? Is it different than fundraising in years past? What is the evolution? Oh, it's, it's continually getting more and more, um, uh, both uh, scientific in that uh, the way you calculate, the way you research uh, individuals and, and, and set up campaigns, very strategic, um, uh, very specialized. Uh, it's a very specialized discipline, but it's, it's not that once you get into it and, and I would encourage people to, like I did, uh, I got into it, but then I went and got a master's degree in it. And then I saw how many different uh, consulting firms and organizations and really schools there are to learn uh, from uh, on, a, on a rather quick pace. And I would highly encourage not only coaches, um, you know, and, and wrestlers, to uh, think about uh, moving uh, toward this type of a career pursuit. It's, uh, it's very rewarding because uh, philanthropy in itself is, is, you know, a word that means uh, uh, many things to many people, but uh, it, it, it's really about humanity, serving humanity uh, and, uh, uh, you know, in a meaningful way and um, actually in a loving way. And uh, that, that's, uh, there couldn't be a higher calling uh, in, in some respects. So uh, we, we get a lot of benefit out of that. Those of us like you, Sally, who work in this, uh, in this world, and uh, it's very rewarding, very gratifying. Uh, it's just, it's full of gratitude for the most part, but it can be tr a lot of trench work and uh, has to be done as we'll get into a little bit of that. Uh, I would say though, uh, just, I would cite the, the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy at the Indiana University, one of the most prominent uh, schools of philanthropy, uh, but so many, uh, so many of your colleges today have degrees, have programs, have certificates that you can, uh, you can find and and stay fairly close to home and uh and get on your own and i would encourage you to uh not only i mean uh, speaking to a coach uh who wants to be you know coaches obviously do a lot of work to better themselves well what better way than to be able to to help uh make for a more sustainable program at your at your institution uh, in doing that by gaining skills, fundraising skills. It's not, it, it's it, like you said, and we know uh, there's, there's uh, it's become very specialized and uh, you need to have the kind of skills that will, will help you uh, uh, generate not only uh, funds, but major type funds. And as we're, we have 
150 new college programs across the entire national landscape. Many of those programs have been stood up within the last year to two years. What do you, what would you tell those coaches that they need to consider when fundraising for a program or a project? Um, well, I'd say, okay, you've got, uh, there, there's a lot there to consider, but one of the rollout initial things that you have to evaluate on your budget, what do I need to compensate my budget? What am I going to have to raise? Um, and, and, and then I have to, you would have to start to create what you call a constituency model. Who are going to be the people that can help me? And, and I put those into categories. Uh, you would, uh, they, some would be alumni, some would be just friends, uh, uh, parents and family of, of your roster. Um, and, uh, and you just go down the line of, of people that, that in sponsors, you know, uh, the people that are involved in the business sector of wrestling and, uh, who, who, who can I put, uh, on this uh, constituency model and in the constituency model that I'm going to need to cultivate and to uh, eventually solicit uh, on behalf of my goal. But is that goal going to be for operational expenses? Um, those are, are probably budget items on your annual budget that you're going to need for travel, for equipment, uh, you know, on and on and on? Or am I going to need more of a capital project to really, am I going to need to build a new wrestling room? Uh, do we need a new wrestling room? So, you know, I hate to say that it's all on you because it's not. You have, you get to work with, with people within your your institution, uh, but they want to know what your priorities are. And you have to look at those priorities and say, okay, I'm going to need this much more money in my budget and I'm willing to help uh, because they're going to say, you know, uh, we're going to need you to help. We're going to need you on the front lines. So you have to prepare yourself for, for that. And the more, you, the more prepared you are, the more training you can get for this, the better you're going to be at it. And um, uh, it's just like it's just like coaching wrestling, in in that sense. And so, um, uh, but there's there's operational expenses, there's capital, uh, and those usually fall under operational expenses. Usually fall under annual solicitation. So that can be a very wide range of people that you're trying to. Uh, generate funding from it can be letters you do it direct mail you most most major gifts and anything substantial you're trying you want to try to have not only um, uh, written communication with email communication with zoom communication with face-to-face uh, -face communication with you want them all as uh as you're asking for more money and more major gifts, but uh, there, there is the annual uh, solicitation that goes on and then there's capital projects that need to occur. And those usually rotate uh, every, you know, three to five years. Um, you're, you're trying to do a major project. That means you're going to focus on those that can give it a little bit higher level that, you know, you know, they have the wealth and um, it's, it's uh, then there's a whole process for uh, the relationship building and the communication with them on a level that will help you get a major gift to your uh, uh, goal. And, uh, that could be, let's say, for example, uh, a facility or a locker room or mats, uh, what have you. And, um, and then there's this category of plan giving and, and a lot of people aren't too familiar with that outside the, the, the fundraising sector. Um, and, and those come in the form of estate gifts, wills, um, 
we're into a campaign right now that uh, uh, is uh, for the endowment fund. And, you know, you get, you build up an endowment fund and it, it goes into an account that cannot be touched. Those monies cannot, the principal. So if I, if the person gives a hundred thousand uh, dollars, that principal, that hundred thousand dollars cannot be touched. It stays in there for as long as the program exists. And uh, you'd like to think for uh, in perpetuity uh, is, is a common word used. It's ongoing, it's forever. And uh, people love that with their estates. Uh, they, they, they want to do something uh, to be remembered by, and they do it and they give to those things that are so important to them in life that they want to see carry on. And missions like ours, uh, Sally, uh, are, are great for those type of prospects. But uh, it usually takes, uh, you know, you want, uh, uh, the longer your program has been around, uh, the, it's not for really young programs necessarily, uh, or institutions or missions. It's those that have been around for a long time. It's a very mature process uh, or prospect that, uh, and your, uh, your mission, your organization, your entity uh, needs to have shown that it, it's been around a long time and it has a chance to stay around forever. And that's what we want. That's what we're doing right now in, with, with our endowment fund is we're trying to grow it and we're trying to uh, uh, talk to people about participating in, in that type of a campaign. But that those are the three, the annual, the, uh, the, the money that comes in it, you need every year from donors and those capital projects that are require major gifts um, and then plan giving. Those are the, those are the three uh, different types of giving uh, and each of them have a discipline and a, a set of requirements, if you will, to them all, but they're relatively easy to understand and learn um, over a little bit of time. And uh, uh, yeah, so. How do you, how would, what advice would you give to coaches on how do they prioritize, prioritize their needs? Well, um, I can't, uh, you know, I, I, um, that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, I think, uh, they have to really look at, at, you know, what's most important, what's, what am I going to, uh, not only have to do to, uh, put out a good product, uh, you know, obviously you want to be successful and you want your program to be successful. So you certainly have to look at what are those line items in my budget that I'm going to have to either beef up or uh, that I'm responsible for. Uh, what new am I going to need? And of course, uh, you know, just prioritizing um, those each year and having a case for them. You know, now we're getting into the fundraising process, which is building a case for support. And uh, that case for support is extremely important. It is your, it is what your, you, you know, why you need these funds for these priorities. This is what it's going to do for us. And you want to try to cover in that case every question that a donor may want to know. And remember, they have the right to know what, uh, what it's going to do, how it's going to do it. And once it gets into it, how is it doing? <laughs> you know, that's, that's part of the responsibility uh, is to update them on how their funds make a difference. And, you know, as a coach, it's, um, it's really putting them into your story. I can't say that enough. We do so much storytelling, S Sally, in our, in our mission, in our work, 
that we have to be good storytellers. But the best way in fundraising is to insert those donors into the story as and find a way to do that. And uh, that makes it, it personalizes it. And uh, sometimes you may have the wrong storylines. So you've got to be careful. You got to do your research. You got to know what they like about certain things and what they don't. And if you're going to some donor about some project or some cause and um, it's, it's not important to them and you're going to get turned away as a result, or you're not going to get what you thought you were going to get. Uh, that that, that uh, can happen and does happen. As, you, as we're talking about um, cultivating donors and really building that base, how, what advice would you give on how coaches can go about building a culture of giving, a culture of philanthropy within their program, or if it's a CEO or leader within I, their I think, nonprofit entity? I think that is one of the most critical things to uh, uh, understanding fundraising, but having a great mission. And, you know, I think it's important to sit down and develop a mission, uh, kind of a mission statement that's personal to, to you and your program and with the collective wisdom, with the collective buy-in of your your leadership, your, your supervisors. Uh, you don't want something that's counter to what they believe in. So you need everybody pulling in the same direction. And this is what, what I feel that we're going to be, uh, why, why we're here, what we're doing, what we're trying to do. I mean, it's part of that case for support is your mission, but you want, you know, like at the hall of fame, I came here in 2004 and it was a big paragraph, big long paragraph about what it is we do. And nobody could ever remember it, even on our board. So we kind of broke it down and we got, we got down to three words, uh, PRI, in fact, uh, preserve, recognize, inspire. And then we have sentences that explain what those are, but uh, uh, to preserve history, to recognize uh, extraordinary individual achievements and to inspire future generations, uh, basically is what what those mean. But it it it's it's easy to remember. Your mission needs to be something that's on your tongue at all times that you're trying to uh, build throughout your program. Uh, what you want to see and what what you feel uh, your constituency being uh, your supervisors, your alumni, what, what they, what they take, will take pride in. And uh, you, you have that case, you have that, that mission statement, and now you're ready to, to, you're ready to make a big difference in, in, you're always ready to tell stories that relate to the mission. That's called alignment. That's very important to have an alignment with your storytelling, with your, your updates, with your, your information that you're sharing with people in your newsletters or your letters, and you're, you're telling stories about your student athletes and what, what, how they're progressing or what they've had to overcome. And, and those stories are critically important, especially in women's wrestling right now. We've got to have stories about women who and, and what they go through. And, and we need that in our sport in a, in a very uh, uh, important way uh, to uh, help us solidify um, our sport and uh, in, in greater society. They need to hear these stories. They need to know what, why is wrestling transformational? Why is it so impactful? Well, it's because, you know, they went through this problem, this problem, or, or uh, they've had to overcome uh, certain situations and, and difficulties and challenges in life. And, um, and, and they found their way. And, 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 you know, those are very, very powerful stories. And, and people want to be a part of that. And uh, you can find a way that 
uh, you know, just by telling an athlete's story on how and relating how their, their, their sponsorship, their funding has made a difference in that person's life. So that's a, that's a relatively either easy set of uh, dots to connect uh, uh, for coaches, but um, yes, it's a, it's a process. And uh, knowing that, you know, having that mission and having those key things that you're trying to develop and, and provide uh, through sport for that roster and for your program and for your team. And uh, it's just wonderful when it comes out of the coach's mouth and to the donor and, 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 sitting there in front of a donor and being able to tell them that, Hey, I know, you know, uh, something about you and maybe you wrestled before, or maybe she wrestled before, or maybe, uh, you know, what they've done in their giving and compare it to, uh, something that's happened in your program through your student athletes. And, uh, that can be very powerful. And uh, that's what you, that, that's what you have to do. Uh, that's what you should be trying to do is put them in the storyline and uh, uh, connect with their values uh, as well. And uh, yeah. How do you, as coaches, as they're going about building their culture of giving, their culture of philanthropy, how important is it for coaches to ask for advice from business leaders, alumni, and other philanthropists um, in their fundraising initiatives and efforts? Well, I'll tell you, it's very important. They want to go to the top. They want to go to the person that has the most influence. The, 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 the bigger the gift, the bigger the gift, the bigger the sponsorship, the bigger the donation, uh, they want to talk to the person that's in charge. Now, sometimes that can be an athletic director at a, at a school, but, but, but who's ultimately responsible for the impact of the wrestling program and the wrestlers? It's the coach. So, yes, they want to hear uh, uh, from you, and they want to know how is, is, is my philanthropy, is my uh, giving making a difference? And I can't stress that enough. Um, you know, if, if you're just giving them uh, the wins and losses, it's, that's, uh, you're missing, you know, it, it, it is important that it's making a difference, but how, how is it making a difference? How is it, how has it changed? How has it helped your, your uh, equipment, your, your ability to get more people, more uh, resources around the people that are impacting that person, such as assistant coaches or uh, even trainers, and and uh, uh, let alone um, you know even get into sport, sports psychologist and all the all the aspects that help the student athlete succeed on the mat and then you've also in college you have the opportunity and in high school you have the opportunity to talk about the educational impact that that's that's going on that's transformational that's needed uh for that person to uh balance uh themselves to be successful in, as student athletes and we know that's a balance between academics and athletics what, as a coach, there's so many things that you need to balance, as, as you said, and where, what are the skills and attributes that you need in coaching that you also need in fundraising? How do coaches become good fundraisers? Well, I, you know, I can't help but think of uh, a few of the traits that we like to tell people here at the National Wrestling Hall of Fame, that these are, these kind of character traits are what stay with the person for a lifetime, uh, not just during a wrestling career, but a lifetime. And that's being persistent, 
um, you know, and, and, uh, uh, but, uh, there, there, you know, there are some key, uh, traits in, in fundraising that, um, you know, that ability, the courage, the, the ability to, uh, you know, stand before someone and state your mission and state your cause and state your need. Um, that can be intimidating, especially the more successful they are. And you're around, you know, you're, you're around millionaires and maybe billionaires. And to stand in front of somebody like that and be able to deliver your mission and your challenge and your need, uh, you know, that, that, that's, that's the kind, it takes courage and it, uh, but it, 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 uh, it's so impressive to them that a, uh, that somebody from the wrestling world would have those capabilities, would have those skills, would have those, because they really think, you know, wrestling can be a very intimate sport and it, it, it can be very eccentric and uh, where, you know, we tend to, uh, a lot of people in wrestling tend to focus inward uh, to, to, to better themselves, to be very focused, very narrow-minded, and then when you get out and talk to people in the outside world who've been very successful and you can communicate something very effectively with them, boy, it says a lot. And, and they're so impressed that they know you've gone through something very tough in life. Wrestling is tough. Not everybody does it because they, they can't endure it. It's physically, mentally challenging. And um, uh, so to be able to, um, you know, develop those traits that can allow you to communicate uh, to people one-on-one. -on -one. one of the great stories is uh, uh, was from an outstanding American of ours that we honor people that have done outstanding things in, in life. Uh, as you well know, saying, uh, Sally, that uh, um, they've done outstanding things in life, but yet have wrestled. And that was the criteria for them to get an Outstanding American Award at the state level or the national level for us. And we've had just tremendous, uh, we have a tremendous number of people who've taken the traits, who've learned from wrestling, who've transformed their lives, and they go out and they become very successful, exactly what, what we're talking about, being able to communicate, being able to focus, being able to transfer those, those uh, traits into, into a bigger world. And, and uh, uh, thank goodness for that. But we had uh, one, uh, uh, he was... Uh, he was he was assigned to a third world country and uh, as an ambassador and they put a hit out on him and uh, he was fighting the drug cartel in in uh, uh, in South America I'm trying to think of the country but uh, and and uh, they put a hit out on him and uh, he got in front of a cartel guy at one time and uh, uh, the, the, the leader and they put a threat in front of him and he just stood there toe to toe and talked like a wrestler would be to, you know, I'm not intimidated in this setting and, uh, only like a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, kind of thing can be. And, and I really think that one-on-one -on -one in wrestling, you think about it in those terms, it, 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 it helps prepare you to go meet people of substantial means of wealthy people. It's not about the wealth that's in the way, it's your perception of it. But remember, it's just like facing off with a wrestler. You don't go out there shaking and, and uh, <laughs> um, you know, you prepare to, you know, give it your best and show up with a, a, a type of confidence that, uh, um is uh is calm but but assured what is it about wrestling that transcends sport and why is it so relevant in today's world 
Well, I think we've talked a lot about that in, in just some of these examples. Uh, but, you know, I, I can't help but think um, that, you know, as I look back on the longevity of this sport, it just always amazes me in the history. And, and you know, people have a, a, a organizations like the United States Olympic Committee, the International Olympic Committee, uh, and people in charge of sport, NCAA, you know, the longer you've been around, uh, the more they they believe that sustainability has something in there that that is very important to society because society society has supported this. Well, look at wrestling. We we can't say that we are at the top tiers of professional sport in the sense of our athletes having professional, being in a professional leagues and, and that kind of thing. Yet we've been around forever. Why is that? That is because they recognize that uh, this sport has a contribution to uh, beyond the map, that it goes to the person and it gives them the the transformational uh, traits needed to be a productive citizen in society. And I think that's the most important thing that uh, uh, one of the most important things that we have going for us as a sport is that uh, they work hard and they they're persistent. They don't you know, they, they keep going through the, the challenges and, and they're, they're, they're confident that they'll keep taking those steps and they'll keep working through adversity. And, you know, in these, in these times, challenging times like COVID, uh, you know, uh, there was no question in my mind that organizations like ours in our sport would come through. These are the times that we shine. Yeah. And and uh, why is that? It's because we're made for tough times. Yeah. And uh, why is it that, uh, you know, the military wants wrestlers, um, our military, our armed forces? Why is it, you know, that 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 that, that is, is it because they understand uh, under duress and under stress and uh, that they're, uh, they can overcome their fears and, and function well. And so, but there's, there's just, there's so many stories and so many ways that, that, uh, um, you know, to tell, uh, regarding this, it would take a whole program in itself. <laughs> and one last question before we open it up for questions from the audience, we have about five minutes left. So if you have any questions, please submit them. On a personal level, Leroy, what is one of the kindest recognitions or thank yous that you've received from one of your players? Oh, uh, you know, the, 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 just their friendship and their um, uh, respect, um, I think, is, is all... Uh, me, me, w means the world to me that, you know, um, I always felt and, and taught and, and learned. Uh, nobody really does things on their own. Uh, you know, you, you get a lot of help. You got to be grateful. Uh, it, 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 it's, you know, even though it's a one-on-one -on -one individual sport, um, you don't do it alone. And you should never forget that. Um, and when I, um, uh, you know, I always tried to coach and thank goodness I had such great mentors that, uh, uh, you know, it's those people that may not uh, get their hand raised all the time, be the best on the team, be the gold medalist. Uh, it's the others uh, that are in the, in the room with you. Uh, if you're a uh, coach of a high school team, college team, it's those that aren't going to make it out on the mat, and yet they come every day. And uh, you, 
you want to treat them with respect. And I've always noticed about uh, the wrestlers is when a coach respects them and gives them uh, that, that uh, type of respect, it grows, but they're grateful for it too. And uh, they often become <laughs> the wealthy people that I've been talking about that go on in life and become successful uh, are those that didn't get the fame in wrestling, but uh, uh, they got the traits. Yep. All right, we got a question in from Brad from Colorado. Building relationships takes time. How do you fast track? How do you fast track confidence and trust from an athlete and the community who are new to your team or your organization? Yeah, well, especially and and put them on a track to really helping your program out. Uh, that's a that's a that's a great question. How to fast track it and how to? Well, I I think just do some simple research and on that individual. You should know that person's bio. You should know if they ever wrestled. You should know why, how, who was, uh, who were, who were the people around that connected them to the program? Why are they connected? Get the get a sense for that. Do that research, and and you may have to go talk to others that know them, uh, but but take the time to do that. And the more you know them the more then you can relate to them and make them part of a story that you think that's what they're interested, you know that's what they're interested in. And, uh, uh, but you can never not, I mean, by showing that type of respect and uh, you can then pretty much ask for almost anything. It doesn't have to be something that they've, they've given to before or they care all the, if, 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 if you show that kind of respect, uh, you'll get it in return uh, no matter what it is you're asking for. Um, uh, that's a good question. And, and I know it's especially coaches, they just don't have time to, to do the, the things that development officers and development, uh, uh, people have, uh, do for, uh, a full-time job. Thank you, Leroy. Thank you very much. This is brings uh, a close to our Living Legends Zoom webinar. Um, I want to thank you, Leroy, for taking time out of your day oh, again. Thank to you, us. Sally. Thank you for what you do to uh, for our sport and your leadership um, has been tremendous. And uh, we're really looking forward to women in wrestling. Uh, uh, we uh wh where that's going to take us and how that's going to take us and i'm very excited and I'm, i have to say this about uh this aspect of our sport uh before i check out is that um you know the research that i'm doing on women and women in philanthropy and philanthropy uh for women uh is is different and it needs to be studied and it needs to be learned and it needs to be appreciated. And as we do that, we're going to experience growth like uh, we hopefully uh, can only imagine and uh, looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Have a good evening and see you soon. Bye-bye.